Uh, my name is Carlos O'Donnell. I work on the platform tools team for Red Hat. I'm the glibc team lead. We handle all of the uh, low-level core glibc issues within Red Hat Enterprise Linux, Fedora, and a couple of other places. Um, the work that we're presenting today is a continuation of a discussion that happened in last year's Cauldron about whole system uh, benchmarking and kind of what it means, how we've taken that idea and, and tried to start slowly an implementation of whole system benchmarking and some of the, uh, the interesting benefits, some of the unintended consequences, some of the difficulties in deciding you know, what data is going to get recorded and things like that. So I want to start off this talk by saying that the, the work here that is being presented um, is uh, DJ Delore's work. He's been working on a public upstream branch, um, uh, DJ slash malloc. Um, you can go look at it right now. You can, you can look at the tracer, the simulator, all the things that are involved in there and have a look at you know, if it makes any performance impact on your code. We'd love to get some feedback. We'll talk about it at the end of the talk. Um, so I've been working with DJ's tools, uh, specifically on some customer issues. And uh, Florian, also on the team, has been assisting with, uh, with tooling, algorithms, discussions, and testing as well. So we've all been kind of looking at this stuff. But uh, this is DJ's baby, which is why DJ's here. Uh, remotely to answer any questions um, that, that we have for him. So I'm going to start with this. Uh, we're presenting experimental results. Please, please, please do not use any of this stuff in it, production uses at all. Uh, you can, but it, you know, it might eat all of your data. It might do very bad things. Um, we are really uh, changing really the behavior of the, the core allocator in some weird ways in order to get trace and things like that. So. Um, a lot of this stuff hasn't gone through the kind of serious, rigorous production kind of testing that you might otherwise go through for uh, core malloc changes, which is why we've got it on an extra branch and why we're asking people to look at the branch and you know, kind of why we're, we're rolling this across in, in stages uh, for the work that we're doing. Um, I'll give an overview. Now, uh, there is a lot to talk about in terms of the whole system benchmarking stuff that we did, and it's just for malloc, really. Um, I want to leave as much time at the end of this talk as I can, so I'm going to go through all these slides quickly. I'm going to go through them quickly because I want you guys to be able to ask questions. And really what we're here for today is to involve other people in uh, consensus, how do we fix some of the problems that we've seen, how do we progress beyond the tracing the malloc API, and if some of the use cases we've come up with are, are interesting things to other people, it makes sense for us to share and it makes sense for us to you know, get involved in, in collaboration that way. So um, we'll talk briefly about what is whole system benchmarking again to get everyone who, who hasn't been involved in discussion on board as to what we're trying to do with that, what's the goal behind it. Um, and then we're going to talk about how we've taken the idea, scaled it down to make it something we can actually implement as a first step, and why we went with uh, malloc API family of functions. So goals of the tracing, what we're doing, some alternate uses we found, problems we ran into, and things like that. So this is what it looks like. Um, so whole system benchmarking was discussed in Cauldron uh, 2015. It's something that we've been talking about for quite a while. It is an outgrowth of the micro benchmarks we have in the library. Today, we have a set of micro benchmarks that we use to do differential performance measurements to kind of objectively look at patches that are coming in that are performance based. You post a patch, you say it makes performance better, we ask you what performance did it make better, you present the micro benchmark and you show this is what got better. The benefit to that is that it is relatively objective. Rel I say relatively because there's still an immense amount of expert opinion that's required to look at the micro benchmarks. The micro benchmarks unfortunately have the flaw that they are small. They are really a subset of the API. You're looking at one function, and you're looking at the performance of just one function. What you really want is a broader view of a family of API functions, and you really want to keep expanding that view to include an entire process, all the API calls that it's making. Um, you know, and that level of complexity to start off with is very daunting. So the community began a microbenchmark initiative, and we currently have a set of microbenchmarks for a lot of the string and memory routines and math library routines, um, that needs to grow. But at the same time, we also need to begin investigating what we're doing here, which is what would it take to grow the micro benchmarks to a point where we are encompassing families of APIs for performance measurement. Um, and 
In fact, the work that we're doing here actually has some, a different set of goals than whole system benchmarking. But my, my secret goal as the team lead is always to take something and make it worth twice what it is, which is we wanted a faster malloc, and at the same time we wanted to start a implementation of whole system benchmarking at the bottom. So like I said, whole system tracing, uh, the entire system is incredibly complicated. There are a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of issues to deal with. Um, Multi-threading, uh, thread ordering of events, and things like that make analyzing a complete system difficult. And in, in fact, last year at Cauldron, we talked a lot about, well, what values are you even going to record when you're doing a trace? Because the data that you're collecting will impact kind of you know, the analysis that you can do at the end of the day, but also it costs. So there are an immense number of trade-offs. Again, we need to scale the problem down to be able to even begin an analysis. So um, you know, whole system tracing. The malloc API is much smaller than an entire system, obviously. And we started at malloc because it was beneficial for the internal project we were doing, which was improving malloc performance. So if you imagine if the goal is to have these micro benchmarks and whole system benchmarks be able to answer a question of differential performance given a patch that's submitted by someone, we are going to benefit. We were looking to submit changes to the malloc implementation. And the only way to defensively say these patches were better was to actually write some kind of uh, performance framework that would allow us to measure before and after the patches for an entire family of API functions that would be impacted by the change. Um, and so, um, so the original goals here so are low overhead. So the trace that we're going to, the trace that we're presenting here, and that is currently in the DJ malloc branch, is very low overhead, specifically because of the high rate of calls for this particular API, and it's it's an interesting and good measure of the trace framework because other APIs in glibc are not like there's a lot of APIs, a, there's a bulk of them that are not performance critical that we may be able to actually use different trace frameworks to log. For example, right now, nothing prevents you from logging every one of the uh, entry points in glibc using system tap. Right? You've got the debug info for the library. You have the library. You can actually use system tap to put uh, uprobes into everywhere that you want to measure something and then record traces. The problem with that is that it's incredibly expensive from the point of view of overhead for a running process because uh, the I shouldn't say incredibly expensive, it's relative cost. So what we were aiming here for was a low overhead trace that recorded events without entering the kernel at all, which meant we had to have an instrumented uh, libc. We also have the ability to show what code paths are taken for coverage. Um, so low overhead as well, we, had, we have single bits in the event traces that allow you to know what paths you've taken through malloc. And that's really interesting when you're looking at well, how often have I taken the hot path? How often have I taken a cold path? How often did I have to go? How often did I have to end, take a lock? How often you know, can I, did I avoid that? And so you, you begin to gather statistics about the running user application. And, uh, and, and not only that, it was we had some difficult scenarios that we, you know, we want to reproduce some kind of behavior. And one of the easy ways to actually do it is to just write the trace by hand. And you'll see why this is beneficial, because we're eventually going to take these traces and we're going to run them through a simulator. And so it, 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 sometimes it's hard to capture a trace of something that you had um, by statistically getting to the point where, oh, I ran through this path. What you really want to do is simulate something that you wrote by hand. So I'll show you some examples of that. Um, so the, the way that this works right now is we have an instrumented libc so.6. Um, and in fact, we'd like to get to the point where this instrumented libc so.6 is what you actually ship in production. Um, we would like the uh, branch portions to be nopped out and potentially conditionally enabled by uh, uprobes. But we have to figure out a way to enhance the kernel uprobes functionality to actually be able to, rather than put in a breakpoint patched into the nop, to patch in uh, potentially a branch instruction to work your way around two clauses of the, of the condition. Um, yes, if, we, if, we, if you go with a production shipped instrumented libc.so.6, it does mean that there's additional iCache pressure 
because the functions are shipping with their instrumentations in place. But the benefit is that if the user you know, buys that as a, as a, buys the fact that they have instrumentation in place, it means that at any point in time when you have a problem, you can turn the trace on, collect a trace, turn the trace back off again, and then take the trace and hand it to Red Hat, or hand it to a user, or hand it to whomever is working with you. You know, do your analysis and your tooling on the trace, and that way uh, you have a way to support production systems with a very detailed trace. And it's a low overhead trace. So it's low overhead because um, we take a singular syscall at the beginning of our trace, usually to record the thread ID. The thread ID is then cached, and all of our events are about behavior of the implementation. We record no time in any of the events. So we never have to go get time of day. We're never looking at the, at the TSC. We're not relying on the processor to give us timing information. And the reason is because what we're looking for is behavioral, behavioral aspects of the application. And we are recording thread IDs. And in fact, the threads are actually are able to, the, the instrumentation is multi-thread safe. The threads are recording their events in the order that they're running them in. And that means that we actually are recording inter-thread ordering, a given inter-thread ordering, and, and I can explain a bit how, how that's possible with malloc. And it, it's possible to record inter-thread ordering in malloc because with the malloc API, you have ownership of the pointer that's given back to you by malloc. So in fact, that pointer that's handed back to you is actually a unique thing. Your thread has access to that pointer. And until you give it to another thread, it is yours to do something with it as you wish. Um, so we don't record any time data. So the data that comes out here on the, on the right-hand side is event trace information recorded by the instrumented library uh, whose control is done by a, usually a preloaded uh, trace control shared object. So for example, if you were running your application on your server, you would restart it with this libc in a trace control that allows you to uh, either attach a debugger and start the trace and then detach, or just start the trace right away from the beginning of the process. Um, this trace, and I'll talk a little bit about it on other slides, is uh, being written to not by the process, but by the kernel. This is a file-backed mapping of the, of the file, but that's a small window of the file. And in fact, as the trace, as the threads go collecting traces, we are sliding the window forward and allowing the threads to write into this window. What that means is that as the pages are being dirtied by the threads that are writing the trace data, it's the kernel's responsibility to find spare time to flush the dirtied pages to disk to put them onto this uh, file-backed mapping. Um, and so what that actually does, what's interesting is, if you would have to collect all of the trace for these things, you would negatively impact the actual perceived RSS of the application that you were tracing. So one of our early implementations, what we actually did was, this was an anonymous mapping that ends up living in the application's address space. And the problem with the anonymous mapping is that it's not being flushed anywhere. And in fact, you can't unmap pieces of it because it's not going to go anywhere. So what it ended up doing is, as you consumed more pages, the process as RSS goes up. And it's, it's difficult to differentiate. You need to do a lot of accounting to say, well, this portion of RSS actually belongs to the trace buffer, and this portion belongs to the application. The way we do it with a sliding window, no, I'm surprised that it did that. Um, when you do it with a sliding window of a memory of a file-backed mapping, you have one window. Or you have provably at most n windows open at a time. And we can talk a bit more detail about that in a bit. But it's a fixed amount of RSS that you consume in the process space. And it's very easy for you to say, OK, we're going to subtract out the 64 meg window that we have. That accounts for our trace information that's in process. And the rest is part of the application's consumed RSS. Um, 
So tracing, what are we tracing? Um, like I said, we're tracing thread IDs, call types, uh, paths to the code, and pass return pointer sizes. And actually for malloc, we're tracing internal chunk information. So the interesting thing is that from a whole system benchmarking perspective, every API we're finding has very different data that you want to collect for it because you're trying to reproduce some behavioral information. Again, because you want to use this data to actually be able to simulate the uses of the API, run it before without your patches, run it after with your patches, and show that there's an improvement without having to have a, an application that you're running. Again, this is a benchmark, a whole system benchmark. Obviously, we've scaled it down to just a, a, a smaller set of an API. So, um, and you know, as we discussed, it's, it's streamed, you get the trace, you get all the things. The traces are very large for applications that do a lot of work in malloc. The largest trace we have to date is a four and a half terabyte trace. Um, it's a lot of data to work through. We're basically into big data territory for analysis. And when we get to the last page of all the slides, um, we can, I, you know, there's, there's a lot of places where we need collaboration with people and companies that understand you know, how we might process this data, how we might split it up, how we're gonna calculate statistics on it quickly. So right now we have kind of a set of rudimentary tools for computing you know, min, max, standard deviation, time it took, time between allocations, you know, how many threads you had and things like that. Um, so again, we go from this raw trace which is huge, four and a half terabytes, we can actually compress this down. We don't have to have the raw traces to run a simulation of what we saw. We actually can take the raw trace and turn it into a much more condensed form that we call a workload file. So what you do with this raw trace is an analysis of how many threads were there. For every thread, as you started allocating memory, who owned the pointer to that memory? When pointer ownership changes, so for example, when you see a thread that mallocs a memory, and then another thread that frees that same memory, it means that had to have been pointer ownership passed to another thread. We introduce a sync point there. That means you preserve the ordering of thread one allocating memory, thread two freeing memory. So these are synchronization points between threads. If you had two threads call free with the same pointer to the memory, it's, it's a defect. And in fact, we can actually detect the defect when we're processing the raw trace file. Um, we also record, we reduce the, this workload file contains a reduction in terms of what calls were made and the arguments to the calls. And the reason I say a reduction is because when we go from here to here, we no longer need the virtual address. So on this side, we actually have a recording of the addresses as they came out of the API calls. But on this side, we can actually talk about those addresses as indexes. Because imagine that a, an application might do you know, 12, 13, 14 billion malloc allocations. We can actually talk about those things as some finite set of unique outstanding pointers. Because at any given point in time, the application might have only had 100,000 objects live at any point. So we can actually take the trace and reduce it to a set of live pointers. And in the trace, we refer to their indexes rather than the actual VA or you know, the actual nth allocation that had happened. So that's an interesting uh, reduction in size. And in fact, if you had a, I think, um, four and a half terabyte trace turns into 130 gigs of workload data. So that's the kind of reduction that, uh, that you're looking at. Um, we then take the workload file, and I'll cover this again, and we simulate it. So we have an API simulator for the malloc family of APIs. And what you do is you take that workload data, and you're really running a, a, a shadow or a shell of what the application was doing with the API. So using, again, the synchronization points that you recorded because of pointer ownership, uh, starting up a thread in the simulator for every thread that was running in the original process, and simulating the API calls. So this isn't obviously high fidelity trace. We've left out timing data. But the hope here is that you get back a simulation that is sufficiently similar that it reproduces the problem you've seen. And um, 
it, is, it has been shocking how well the results of the simulator actually mirror the, cap, the captured data from the real running application, with the only difference being that generally your time frame is either compressed or expanded. Because remember, the event data contains no timestamp. In the future, it could be possible for us to collect timestamp data at some low cost interval into the trace of events, which would actually give us some temporal information about the sequence of events that were recorded for the API trace. But again, we run the simulation and we run it with the library under test. And you can do this as many times as you want now because you don't have the application anymore. What you have is a shell of the recorded data from the API and you rerun it as many times as you want. And in fact, we've worked with several customers and we have, uh, we've, we've done this, gotten traces from them, and then begun permuting the tunables inside of malloc to figure out what gave them best performance for least RSS or a trade-off point. And you can then, given a workload, come up with a, a set of recommended tunables that gives them kind of this ballistic um, you know, uh, curve where you, you have a trade-off point or an inflection point for minimum RSS, performance of the application, and the trade-offs therein. And you can really answer customer questions. Um, but this is, um, so this is kind of an alternate use. Because again, remember that we're designing this right now to help us in the malloc patches that we're currently working on. Um, so we've talked about some of these initial implementation problems that we had, uh, but I'll, I'll go over some of these. So the reality is that the implementation we have today that is in the DJ malloc branch is actually, we've rewritten the tools about three times. And we've written the tools about three times because we started with simple tools, a workload converter that was written in Perl. We started with uh, a naive mmap into the process's address space for the trace data, an anonymous map. And what we found is as you work with more users and the, the cases become more complex, we've gotten a significant number of refinements. And so DJ knows this, but there was really a trial by fire for him in the implementation as we began to take in more users and test larger and larger data captures for the whole system benchmarking. So um, the first thing we hit is if, if we were sloppy, you know, 32-bit limits. Um, some I.O. performance issue, there were some speed and memory trade-offs. Um, getting to the point where we used uh, a sliding window into the file took us quite a while. And in fact, the sliding window algorithm that we have is interesting because um, for every window, you have any number of threads still writing events into it. So you can't unmap it until the window's use count reaches zero. So we actually have ref counted windows into the file. And as those windows slide and the ref counts drop off to zero, you can then unmap them. And you have to make some trade-off choices. And we, we, you know, in the code, we've made some trade-off choices because at one point, you basically can have up to, for every thread, one open window into the memory mapped file backed trace file because each of the threads might have advanced sufficiently far. In general, that's not often what happens. The threads stay pretty close to each other in most of the processes we've seen. Uh, temporally, the mallocs seem to be related to each other. But you could conceivably have n times, which is number of threads, windows open into the trace buffer. But whenever the windows overlap and two threads are on one trace buffer, it'll just be one, tr one, one window into that trace stream. Uh, if you have any questions, please ask. Yeah, go ahead. So you implemented the data identifier only to avoid the anonymous map, or was there another reason for that? Um, it is specifically to avoid the anonymous map, because the anonymous map causes real difficulty in distinguishing when the kernel has brought pages in from the anonymous map, and they consume RSS. And so you don't know, like it's very difficult to determine how much of the anonymous map is currently in place without calling mincore to figure out how many of those pages are technically in RSS. So if you know there's a kernel syscall called mincore that you give it an IO vec and it gives you back one bit in each IO vec for every page that's possibly in RSS. Without doing that, you have no idea. And without doing that, you can't disambiguate between the trace data that's in process and how much RSS is consumed by the application. So with the window, you're actually, uh, you, you can make 
a very good assumption about what's the upper bound of the number of pages you consumed in, uh, in process trace. It's a it's a narrow it's an M map of a it's sixty. No anonymous. It's no longer an anonymous mapping yet. Also, it's not anonymous because the other problem is uh, the anonymous mapping has to be written out. And so when we first started this, and I'll, I'll give the anecdote, we said, okay, now it's time to exit your application. And the user are like, our application never exits; it runs forever. And we're like, ah, oh, because we'd had a destructor that took the anonymous M map and flushed it to disk. And so once the users told us that they never did it, we're like, okay, so attach with GDB, call the inf use the inferior call functionality to call the destructor itself. But after you do that, don't do anything else and just terminate the application and collect the trace. So really what we wanted was, in the event the application crashes, you're gonna get as much data as the kernel has paged, has put, has, has written to disk as part of the, as part of the, the dirty page error process. So you don't, no, you don't have all of it. And in fact, there are some guarantee, like Linux is actually has a lot of stronger guarantees than we're giving it credit for in terms of um, whether or not these pages have been written to disk yet. But uh, we do actually have the, uh, if, if I back up all the way to the uh, trace control DSO, it actually has um, API points for stopping the trace and syncing it. But this, the sync is not really required because the, the things, Linux will generally keep the, the, that mapping in sync. So you don't have to call f-sync for that. Um, yes? What's the size of the window, please? And if you, if you fix, if you experiment with a correlated size of the window with the number of threads? Um, so the size of the window is presently fixed. We're using uh, 64 meg mappings. And so it's a trade-off. Because every time you fill a window, you actually have to do, you, there's a, a, a sequence of syscalls you have to take that cost in terms of application overhead. We have not played with window sizing. The smaller you make the window, the more frequently you have to ship the window. Um, but the less, the smaller the RSS overhead inside the process. The bigger the window, the bigger the RSS overhead, RSS in the process. So it impacts the process if you're consuming memory inside the process. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think that some of the parameters of the uh, trace uh, the low overhead trace that we have for the malloc API family would will be will be tunable. They'll have to be changeable in some sense. Um, I have a follow -up question. Yeah, go ahead. That was the first implementation. Okay. That's why I said that was the first one. The new one is a file backed mapping, right? So it's a file backed mapping with a sliding window into the file backed mapping, and the windows are ref counted. And there is a, a kind of a, a lockless handoff where you, you increment the ref counts, and then only at the time when the ref counts drop to zero, you unmap the window, and you map in a new window with a new window and number. Could sure. You just repeat again why you have multiple windows, which is still right? Yes. So right. the th thread, you can have n threads writing into window one, and the last thread fills the window and needs to advance. So at the advance point, one th this one thread will move over, map a new window, right? And so at that point, your consumed RSS in the process is original window plus probably a page of the next window as the kernel brings in that page for you. This window has a ref count equal to the number of threads in that window. This window has ref count one. It's got a single thread in it. As all the threads advance and the ref count for the previous window drops to zero, we unmap it. And so what you'll see actually, interestingly, I, I didn't put a graph of it, but on a stable machine where you would otherwise expect RSS to be straight, you actually see a little zigzag like this, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, because uh, at, even though you might be calling malloc free, malloc free, malloc free, and the RSS should be stable, the trace window is recording events, so you're actually zagging up to a window unmapping the window, zagging up to fill a window, unmapping the window. And so the reason we do that, the reason we did the windowing is because you minimize the, you minimize the impact on the RSS of the application to this little zigzag. The smaller the window, the smaller the zag, but the more it costs in overhead in terms of syscalls. So there's, there's a real ability to play with the trade-offs of the size of the windows and, uh, and how much you're recording. Mean, the mean, probably, the mean RSS is constant throughout the lifetime of the application. Yes. 
Um, and I'll discuss one of the remains in the current implementation that I don't know how to fix. And we'll, we'll talk about it in a second. How much time do I have in the talk, by the way? 15 minutes? Yeah, OK. All right, implementation problems. We cannot fix mremap. It actually it causes a thread. And so if you're familiar with some parallelism and concurrency language, there are, there are execution orderings of the threads that we are trying to capture. mremap actually causes us to be unable to capture or disambiguate between two given execution orderings. The reason is thus. So thread one calls realloc. And you are approaching a very efficient syscall, which is called mremap. The purpose of mremap is to take the pointer that you have, give you a new pointer at a new VA, but make it longer. So you're asking the kernel for assistance to take the pages you have, remap them to another virtual address, and extend the range. The reason you do this is it avoids needing to copy the pages. Realloc would needlessly copy the pages if you did another malloc, but bigger, copied all the pages over, and then handed that back to the user as part of the realloc. So the kernel assists you. But one of the key fundamentals we have with the malloc API is that pointer ownership matters to ensure that the execution ordering recorded in the buffer makes sense and is an execution ordering that we can run in the simulator. So when thread one calls mremap, you get a pointer back with its new size. But the original pointer is lost. From your perspective in user space, it's an atomic operation where the pointer you used to have is now free to be reused by another mmap. While you're doing this, another thread called malloc gets pointer A as a result, because pointer A is no longer owned by thread one. It lost it when it did the remap. And in fact, thread two can then go ahead and say, hey, I, I got that memory. And it records an event in your trace buffer. Thread one finally finishes saying, this is going to be problematic, folks, because it also records, it records a realloc event for pointer A becoming pointer B. And so what you'll notice here is this happens. The trace now looks like this. Thread one records a malloc of pointer A. Thread two records a um, sorry records a records a realloc of pointer A. And sorry, no. So this is outside of the trace. So initially, thread one has to record a malloc because it's going to realloc that data eventually. Thread two, which is the one that got interleaved because of the mremap, records a malloc of pointer A. Thread one records a realloc of pointer A to pointer B. And you'll notice that this is not causal, right? Um, the, the recorded events, this should, could never happen. You can't have thread two recording, hey, I got this memory, and then thread one says, well, actually, I realloced it to pointer B. This is not true. So in the event buffer, you get T2 and T1 out of order. And the reality is that in the, the actually causal execution ordering that makes sense, these two should have been inverted. Have you get T2 here um, you cannot because of the ownership of that pointer. So, this, so thread one during a malloc is going to be the only thread owning that pointer when it gets it. You can't have this move up above this because um, pointer A is not going to be handed out to anyone else. It's just part of the guarantee of the malloc API. Yeah. Um, and you have to actually trust your buffer properly. No. So, yeah, go ahead, DJ. The problem is that the, the point where you record the record in the trace buffer determines the sequence that the events show up in the buffer. And at the point where you claim your space in the buffer, you have to own all of the information you're putting in the trace record. Yeah. So because you don't own both pointers, 
there's the possibility that another thread's event gets reordered in front of yours. And when you, tr when you look at the execution ordering of the trace, it doesn't make sense. Um, so M remap, because it atomically takes away your ownership of pointer A, you no longer can record an event saying, hey, I, I did this with these two pointers because someone else can come in and, and record in front of you. Um, the one way to do this is to detect it. So the, the trace conversion can actually detect an out of order and reorder the events for you to give you a, 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 an allowable execution ordering, right? Because what you've done is you've recorded the machine, you've recorded the threaded state and there's been a reordering and so you reorder to, to, to have an allowed execution ordering. The other suggestion which Torvald Regal suggested is split the, uh, split the realloc event in two. Record an event when you own the first pointer, record an event when you own the second pointer. So that this would become thread one records a malloc of pointer A part one, and then you'd see part two underneath this line. And that would be an immediate way to note that someone had inserted an event in the middle of you doing the mremap syscall when you lost ownership of the, of the first pointer. And so that way, the simulator could then make a choice to say, okay, Two possible execution orderings are this happened before or this happened after, right? And you, unfortunately, um, you, you have to make a choice between which one of those you want to have. Um, I think if it, if it happens, it, you can, you, you're able to make a choice at that point. Um, there are a, so yes, the probes are there. Um, what I mean to say is that it's from the Yeah, so um, the trace events, the way we have them in the code right now, don't use system tap. Because to use system tap, obviously, it's a NOP sequence that takes a breakpoint in the kernel to do all this other work. That's, yeah. I'm not suggesting to use You're saying that it's already doing that? Yeah. But it, it should be fine if, if, if you're facing things like that. Yeah, it's just that, um, yeah, exactly. So I mean, the, the question is, how, how, do you, how do you catch this case? Because right now, you kind of look at this and you have to guess. So the way, you, the way we think we could catch it more easily is if you split the event into two events, and then uh, it's very obvious when an event gets inserted in between the two events that you have. So thread one's execution ordering are these two events. And once you see other threads, you're able to say, oh, there's a happens before relationship between the, the final thread one realloc event and all the other events that were inserted in between, between that event sequence. Uh, the other thing, the other way would probably be to add an index to every item in the loop. To add an index to? To every item in the loop. So along with the address, you, you basically have also the index address. Yeah. Auto that's, um, that's a good point. So yeah. So that would be recording a generation counter for the address, so that when you see two address A's, you record the generation counter. The, the cost of that is the generation counter and the atomic increment for the generation counter, so it's... Actually, I, I, would, I would have thought storage for that would be worse. Yeah, storage, storage is, yeah. Well, but atomic increment requires cache line ownership, and then that might be expensive depending on the architecture you're on. And yeah. Yeah. Caching or, or cache pressure is not your biggest performance issue. Your biggest performance issue is probably lock compression, which which usually is the case with malloc. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So cache pressure is never going to be a problem for you. Yeah. Well, right. so if so cache pressure turns out to be a problem, then your workload matching with just malloc is not sufficient. You need to actually add three functions. Yeah. The, absolutely. For a whole system, whole system, yeah. So right now we're only looking at the malloc APIs, yeah. So you're right, there's probably two ways. One is generation counter on the address ownership, 
and then uh, splitting realloc into two. Yeah. So there are lots of alternate uses that have started to come up. Again, the design of the whole testing framework was get a patch, put it in, measure the performance, yeah. simulate it again, look at it afterwards. And the nominal notion is that just like our micro benchmarks in upstream glibc are meant to represent real user applications, the whole system benchmarks can represent real user workloads. And so, for example, reproducing difficult environments. Users don't have to hand you their code. They run the, they run right now, we've been able to actually work with customers on, you've got a malloc problem, run the tracer, give us the trace back. We take the trace back, we run the simulation locally, and we look at what behaviors impact the trace. So for example, we had a customer saying, we've got a lot of RSS usage, what's your problem? We get the trace back, and I'll give you some examples. This is a log log chart that you can get from an application run saying, these are allocation sizes, this is the number of times you allocated that thing. So for example, you can see, bam, they don't allocate anything bigger than about a meg, right? But when you go down to here, oh my goodness, you've got a billion 13 byte objects, right? You know what's gonna be your problem? Malloc chunk size is 32 bytes minimum, right? So the amount of overhead for this is enormous. So you can actually produce internal fragmentation graphs for the user and say, you're at 75% internal fragmentation. We are handing you back large chunks for very small amounts of memory. We either, they either accept that or we have to start thinking about glibc's malloc saying, do we need an, a size efficient representation of small allocations? TC malloc has one, right? Um, another graph is, um, uh, here is number of events, and I'll make a note here, these are actually downsampled. You cannot, there is no tool that lets you graph four and a half terabytes of data. So that for the four and a half terabyte data, we did, we have a downsampling process by which we ram the, uh, the API trace through a downsampling process, and we're using incredibly trivial nth sample downsampling, and, but we record max and mean within the range of the nth downsample. There are so many more ways in which we could downsample this, but it requires big data analysis of the files because you can do partition downsampling, you can do triangle downsampling, and so really what's going on here, this is kind of a view of um, allocation request sizes by event, by event number. So pretend this is like our abstracted linear time of events. Um, really the reality is between here and here could be a whole year if you didn't ever call malloc and free, but you don't notice it from the simulation. So like I said, the simulation records the behavioral aspect of the API, but the time is compressed or expanded depending on what's, what's going on. Um, this is what it looks like to the user when they see things. This black line is ideal RSS. If the allocator was perfect, didn't waste any bytes, that black line is where you would be. The blue line is where you actually are, and the red line is actually how much virtual address space is being used by the process as it's running. So when you get the trace, you can tell the user, this line is positive. It has a positive growing slope when I, do, when I, when I look at this data. It could mean that within the algorithms you're using, you're gonna see a linear increase in memory over time, perhaps. Perhaps the user is already telling us, I'm seeing linear growth in memory. You can actually see this blue line has a clear positive upward slope. And this line and this line, their slopes differ by a factor of three. Why is that? Because there's a billion 13 byte allocations that have a huge internal fragmentation overhead. So as this line goes up, this line goes up by a, a factor of all of the external fragmentation, sorry, the internal fragmentation that's going on because we hand back larger chunk sizes. So, it lets you do this kind of analysis. And in fact, DJ, are you, can, you, can you hear us right now? Yes. I did not include a picture of your beautiful heap colored graphs. Yeah. So we should have. So DJ also has a heap colorer that basically at any point in time you can just take a, a big picture view of the heap and it's colored in terms of, you know, red is a fast bin, blue is a, a small bin. And you can see kind of a spread out view of the arenas and heaps. Very interesting for developers, 
or I mean, glibc developers, it's harder for uh, users because they have to know the internals of glibc of the malloc for you to be able to understand them. So um, the graph kind of gives you a visual overview of how you're consuming the heaps and the arenas. But this is the kind of data that we're getting out of our tool right now and helping people um, kind of understand what's going on with their application. But again, we'd want two differential graphs of this with our new uh, malloc patches, which include a thread local cache, to show, um, to show gain. Right? So when we run the simulator, we want the simulator's timing data. So the simulator does actually have timing data. We time the simulator when we run all these runs. And what we want is the differential runs of the same workload in the simulator to show a performance gain given a patch that you're working on as a developer. Um, so some optimizations uh, that, that we did, we've already talked about some of these optimizations. So analysis tools, you know, we're reducing these in things into workloads. Uh, trace files are large, but very comprehensible because they're binary. They're, the event records we have are binary event records. Uh, we're not compressing them just to save time while we're taking the traces because we're trying to reduce the overhead of the traces. And because we're windowing, we're basically writing uncompressed binary traces to disk. Um, so uh, again, windowed buffers for speed, mmax, so that the kernel at its leisure can, can put those pages to disk. Um, and then a, a TJ's reminder, never use int where size t is the right choice because We've actually, as we've scaled it up beyond 32-bit limits for traces and memory sizes and things on 64-bit processes, we had to go in through and clean up all of our code to make it 64-bit safe and things like that. So um, it, it really reminds you how terrible you are at remembering to do these things. So you have to have a, a mindset for the, for the development for that. And the tracing tool is awesome, DJ. Um, opportunities. Uh, we really need help deciding how we're going to further expand this work and how we're going to use it. So today, we could take the trace infrastructure that we have and actually begin using it to collect representative GNU user application workloads that are indicative of how our users are using this API. So we could collect them, and we could then run them, let's say, from release to release to see, did we get better? Did we get worse? And these collected workloads become a corpus of workloads that we have right now only for the malloc API trace. Um, we need help writing tools that work faster analyzing the data traces. We have very rudimentary tools right now for analyzing trace, providing statistics about the trace, meaningful numbers. So for example, in the, the use case for the graphs I showed, I, I did the analysis for it, got the mean allocation size. Once you know the mean allocation size, you can actually set your trim value to just below the mean which means that on average, the user is going to be trimming quite frequently. But when you do that, you end up seeing the blue line come way down to just above the black line. Black line, remember, was ideal RSS for a perfect allocator. Blue is glibc's current scheme, and it's working. And when you bring that trim, when you increase the trimming by bringing it just below the mean value for the entire runtime, you can really see uh, you really see how you can bring the RSS usage down but you're trading that for the cost of the frequent trimming. So again, the, the tooling and the trace capture lets you see how you trade that off. One thing that occurs to me that you probably already thought of or already do is if you have a thread that every so often captures the RSS values and puts them in the trace so that you can keep track of where the RSS is over, over time rather than having to deal with external tools. Um, so we haven't done it yet, but it's on our list of things we have to do. So what we should have captured is we should have added an event to the trace to do an infrequent capture of RSS and then compared it. So the thing is, our RSS right now is coming from the simulator. So we actually capture the trace. When we run it in the simulator, the simulator spends some amount of time doing uh, counting. So it accounts for um, the ideal RSS. It measures its own um, actual used RSS. So Remember that in some aspects, our original design goals were to have the workload, have the patch, run it once without the patch, run it once again with the patch in the simulation. So from that perspective, recording the, RS, the original RSS doesn't matter. But if you're a user, you, you really want to know, like, I'd like to know my recorded RSS. And in fact, what was kind of lame is we kind of have to get the user to run a script and say, well, can you run a script and have the script record the RSS every 30 seconds or something and then give us back the trace? 
And so then from there, you can kind of take the visual of the, of the RSS and compare it against how the simulator ran. And so that's where we're getting our data from. And that's, that's how we're saying, OK, our simulations are actually pretty close to the original RSS. But like I said, there's time dilation. Because in the simulation, I don't care about the actual relative time. What I want is the behavioral aspects. I want the inter-thread synchronization to happen. And then I want to simulate the API so that I can, I can look at that workload. But again, in terms of user debugging, yeah. not only RSSS, but timestamps would allow the user to, to know things you know, like TCP packets coming in or some other things that are not calculated as part of your thing. Exactly. So again, we've this is a, we've minimized as much as possible. So LTT, LTTNG UST, which is the user space tracing probe, for every event they always capture time, and they do it because then once you know time, you can compare traces. And in fact, the LTTNG community has said the one thing we've learned is that you almost always want to capture time because there are so many external events you want to compare against that it becomes very useful. It's it, right now. With the trace we're doing now, we don't want to capture time because of the cost. So we needed a low cost way to record time. I think the way that we'll do it is to, whenever we have to change windows, we can, we can insert a time record. Because we are already having to pay the cost of the M unmap and the map that inserting a, a, a get time of day makes, makes absolutely almost no difference. And we might be able to hide that latency in the rest of the events that we're doing, so you never really perceive it. Um, so one of the, the I think that's, thank you. So that, that's thanks, but we'll, we can keep talking in a second. Um, how much time do we have left right now? Minus 10. Minus 10, oh geez. <laughs> All right, do you guys have any more questions? Questions for DJ, questions about the implementation? DJ, do you have any questions for the audience? You know, I'll flip back to you. Uh, Mm -hmm. as input to the microphone. Meaning you, you have this workload, uh, a simulation workload, which will probably stay run for 30 minutes or something like that. Ha, like 72 hours for the largest one we have. But that's the four, four and a half gigabyte trace is like, out, like days of, of simulated data. Right. So if you, can make, if, you, if you can make a workload that is smaller but representative, it would be great to have that in the micro benchmark and use that for measurement instead of something synthetic that we have. So that's one of the things that we had on the last slide, which is what can we measure? So I think DJ, you had like LibreOffice workloads, right? That like you would, you measured LibreOffice running on a big spreadsheet that yeah. that you have. And you could so, yeah, so for, for example, uh, for example, uh, you know, the the Yeah. We would, we would call that like DJ's wife's workload. <laughs> no, it's still LibreOffice, though. You can say LibreOffice. <laughs> yeah. It's still yeah, it's, it's, it's called OOCal workload. Yeah. But, 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 
so just Sudesh, to also answer your question, you wanted that trace data to feed into the micro benchmark. We can do that today, actually, because we've got the simulator and we've got trace data. So we could immediately replace some of the malloc micro benchmarks with basically just smaller data sets because it, because right now it's only the malloc family of function calls. So we could replace one of the benchmarks with the simulator plus the small data sets to give more realistic workloads. Yeah. So one, one, one use case that I can think of is like a network application where you have a two, app, two machines. <coughs> Setting it up for anybody is obviously hard. So like just running MySQL. Yeah. But you want to have a MySQL workload that, you know, that actually means something to you. Right? Yeah. Or you just use this bench as the benchmark site. Yeah. And, and uh, it, you know, again, um, you know, um, DJ, I'll just cover you up for a second and I'll flip back to the slide. Um, you know, deciding which applications to be traced and basically building the corpus of applications which we care about is really about getting our users to give us traces. Um, right now, I have no idea where we're going to store them because we're actually going to end up with very large traces. But that's another problem. We've now gotten to the phase where we actually have some trace. So, um, so we need help analyzing the traces. Uh, making the tooling better for analyzing the traces, uh, speeding up graphing for analyzing the traces. And the last one is the interesting one, which is extending the tracing to other APIs. The tracing we have in malloc is very bespoke. It is specific to this way and the velocity of this API. I do not recommend that we use this for every other API in LibC. In fact, we should be putting STAP points everywhere in all our APIs so that we can just collect low volume trace data from the other non-performance related APIs in easy ways with system tap. For the things that are high performance, we can reuse this framework that we've done for malloc. We probably more than likely have to create our own new record types to, because what we found is that for any one of these APIs you look at, there's almost invariably different kind of data you're trying to collect depending on what you want to do and what the API is. So we knew that was going to be the case. Now we have proof because we did it for the malloc family of APIs. My gut feeling here is that uh, is probably the degenerate case. It, it, it is. Case. Yeah, it is the degenerate case. Yeah. But we, we, we needed it. It's we need it because we're working on it. Yeah. 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 So what I'm trying to say is that with, with No, actually, yeah. I was thinking in terms of people reach out to us, the HPC folks, because you know they have these these problems in scale already, mm -hmm. you know, and they also have other things like math libraries where they they would would be high volume for them. But yeah, it's 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 high volume in, in terms of the amount of data, but in in terms of the data structure, that is mm -hmm. per call, the amount of data that you want yeah. to capture. I don't know, but per call, probably Malloc has what? What are we? Doing the yeah. thread ID. Yeah, the incoming arguments, the outgoing arguments, and um, a, just the, a little bit of internal data, which is uh, chunk size, right? Because you, you, don't, you won't know what the. So those are not recorded because they weren't relevant to re simulating the data for the patch performance difference adjustment. They would be useful information for you to know. And in fact, I will say this. Per event, per binary event, we have 64 bytes per binary event right now. And we, there is ample room in there to put more data in. So for example, I ran a simulation on a very large scale NUMA machine. And it was terrible. The performance was abysmal. Mostly because the workload the customer gave me has never been run on a, on a NUMA machine. And the inter-thread memory cross NUMA a VDSO call that will tell us what CPU we're on. But I don't know. I, I saw some discussion about how, to, how from user space to get per, per CPU data in the, in the VDSO. And that just seems legitimate for 
Yeah. So you want to record kind of what CPU you were on, and then you can see if a thread actually moved, and then you can see the impact. So. Oh, and, uh, I guess recording Arena is a bad idea, but it ties into the design of the car. You want to be able to. I don't. I don't care really. I, I, I mean, right now this trace is is for glibc. This so tracing, you're yeah. You're not. You're not measuring. Uh, you're not recording Arena. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. What I'm saying is that. If you're thinking about doing it, don't do it. Okay. So that, uh, so that you, you can actually, if, if the underlying malloc changes yeah. to, to anything else, you don't have to change the trace data. The trace data is remain. Yeah, and so in and fact. In the future, you can use it for other. Yeah. Uh, the, the other point I want to make is that there are better tools for managing trace data. So, for example, um, LTTNG and a number of other projects have standardized on CTF for trace data format in, on file system. And so really, it behooves us to have a converter to output CTF data from the workload or the raw trace so that other people in other realms can run the app, get the trace, convert it to CTF, load it up in whatever tooling they want, they can process CTF. Because our, our tooling is, is, has a very specific design goal in mind. And so for, the, for these high speed traces, we really probably want CTF as the output at some point. So again, we then need people to help write a raw trace to CTF converter, and maybe even some kind of descriptive header to tell you what's, what, the event look, what the event record looks like. Because we've already tr changed the event record layout a couple times, and we've had to write converters in between the tools to convert the old data to the new data. And so if the data was a little more self-descriptive, I think it would, it would benefit us for con future conversion. So, yes? A uh, question about this general method. So at the start of the presentation, it says whole system tracing. But from what I understand, what you do here is you pick one layer of the system and get a very detailed trace of it. And then you can replay that trace on uh, another system and tune the layer you're looking at in the fake malloc yep. and see if you can get it to work better. Yes. Yeah, there is. You come and volunteer your time, and you add tracing to the rest of the APIs, and then we okay. collect traces of that, and then we start talking about it. Okay, but suppose we have two layers. <laughs> Let's say there's malloc, and then there's my system that uses malloc. Yeah. And I collect a trace for each one of those. Yeah. So I have two traces for different layers. You you wouldn't have done that. Okay. So the there has so part of the causal so. When you run it in the simulator, you need to have taken a, a valid thread execution ordering and recreated it in the simulator. The only way to do that is to sequence things in a global event buffer to ensure that there's an execution ordering that you can reproduce from the trace. So if you had two layers, both layers have to write into the same global buffer in order for you to get a valid execution ordering. And I need to stop because Jeremy says that it's time for you guys to go eat or do something else. <laughs> but it's a very good question. But the, the answer is you need a way to ensure some kind of ordering constraint to provide a total ordering for the event. It, it doesn't have to be totally ordered. In fact, we can relax that criteria. But you have to end up with a way to make a decision in the simulator about what's a valid execution ordering when you make that choice. So does that answer your question? Uh, I can ask. Yeah, sure. Um, DJ, thank you very much, and thank you for the work. <laughs>